So again, it's building a theology of the glory of God, and we've been through several lessons uh, prior to today. So if you're a visitor this morning, or you haven't heard all the lessons, keep that in mind. They're, they're recorded, so you can go on to our YouTube channel, as well as, uh, I'm not sure if it's all through YouTube, but you can get it through our church app as well, and Thank you. Is it the coat? Okay. So, where we are in the Glory of God series is this is the last lesson pretty much on doctrine. So we've had eight general lessons, some of them multi-part like this one. And we started out with uh, the Old Testament and worked through the New Testament looking at a biblical theology of the glory of God, and then we have now transitioned into a systematic theology. Now that we've gone through the Bible, we're trying to look at the glory of God as a whole as it's taught in Scripture. Um, I'm going to set that there just in case. If this keeps making interference, I'll switch. And can you just Thanks. Okay. So, where we are is, and Davin, would you be willing to help me and hand those out? There's handouts there. Is we're building a theology of the glory of God, and what we're doing is, uh, like I've said the last two lessons, is we're building systematic theology. And it is a work in progress, that's why it's building. Um, And the question we're trying to answer is, how do we build a systematic theology of the glory of God? Because... When we looked at the biblical theology, that means we looked at what the glory of God is taught in the Bible and its places in the Bible where it occurs, starting from Genesis on out to Revelation. And of course, those studies were representative. They're not exhaustive of even the scriptures. But when we looked at that through the Bible, we came up with a lot of different nuances and meanings And now we're seeking to consolidate those into summary statements. We're seeking to understand more now uh, about how what we summarize relates to God. And we've done that in the last two lessons. So if you have the handout, we did a review on point one of the biblical theology of God's glory. And then two, we developed a summary definition of the multiple biblical meanings of God's glory. So we sought to bring out those multiple meanings together and we came up with a summary definition that's uh, still a work in progress and is certainly not capturing all the meanings that we discovered in our study, but it is covering the major ones. And then point three, we were seeking to understand particularly how God's intrinsic glory, once we defined what his intrinsic glory was, we're seeking to see how that relates to him, to God himself. Like uh, if someone teaches you about immutability and they tell you that God is not, does not change, and you understand that doctrine of immutability as a definition then you would look and see what is that teaching us about God and consider God himself with all the different perspectives and angles we can consider with that doctrine of immutability. Well, we're doing that now in point three with God's glory, or we did it. And then point four, which is where we're at this morning, is after answering what is God's intrinsic glory as it relates to God himself, Um, now we're on point four. And it's just, now that we have a pretty good systematic definition of what God's glory is, and we understand better what God's intrinsic glory is, now we're going to kind of take a step back and consider the expressions of God's intrinsic glory, which is his extrinsic glory, in relation to important truths in the Bible. 
we're also going to consider redemptive history and see how those are expressed in redemptive history and important truths in redemptive history. And some of this will seem repetitive from what we've looked at on our biblical theology, but now in taking a step back with all this systematic theology that we've done and looking at it, we can uh, consider things not just in their uh, place in which they occur, but we can consider things more holistically and see how this, that God's glory is revealed in his transcendence and his eminence and his fullness and being receiving of glory. So, and if those words intrinsic and extrinsic are foreign to you, um, meaning you've never heard them used with reference to glory, uh, that's probably because you just weren't in the class last week. But if you have your handout, it's on the second page, and it's about the top of that page. And the handout that's, got hand, that's been handed out today is an updated version from the previous versions. So if I'm referencing point four this morning and it's subpoints, and you're saying, where is it on my handout? That's probably because you have an old handout. So try to get the new one from this morning. Um, and let me go back to point two, developing a summary definition, and read that summary definition. It's on page one at the bottom. The triune God, who is glorious, displays his intertrinitarian glory largely through his creation, image bearers, providence, and redemptive acts. God's people respond by glorifying him, God receives glory and through uniting his people to Christ shares his glory with them all to his inter-Trinitarian glory. So that was seeking to bring together a lot of the major elements that we saw when we did our, when we went through the Bible looking at how glory was meaning in its various places. Any questions on that summary definition? Or Uh, comments that anybody might want to add before we move to the next part. All right. And point three, I'm just reminding you of the former two lessons before we jump into four. It just, I think a short review helps us get in the right frame of mind before we get to diving into today's lesson. So point three, understanding how God's glory relates to himself. Uh, When you seek to better understand God's glory, particularly his intrinsic glory, you'll find in reading historical theology that there's differences of opinions. And we need to consider that, and we need to consider again what the biblical theology revealed, what we studied in the Bible about God's glory and seek to come up with uh, something that is faithful to the scriptures. And there's the definition under point one for intrinsic and extrinsic. Uh, If you will remember, God's intrinsic glory is that glory that he is and possesses, if you want to use the word possess, uh, that's inherent to him. It's of his essence, his real nature. Um, it's uh, not able to be separated from God. It is who he is, glorious. However, extrinsic glory of God is him manifesting who he is in his intrinsic glory through his acts, through his works, through his words. Uh, Everything that we see Uh, whether it be creation, God's sovereignty in the fall, uh, the Bible, redemptive history, Israel, the prophets, the incarnation, uh, our own salvation, all those things are God's manifestations of God's intrinsic glory through extrinsically and gloriously performing these works. And the extrinsic glory of God is not essential to his nature. There's nothing in God that, that requires or demands of him that he does what he does in creation and redemption. It's of his own good pleasure. 
God does not need man. He does not need angels or creation in any sense of any perspective, whether some people say, well, yeah, he doesn't need man or creation in the sense of he's self-sustaining, like we need food and we need water. He doesn't need anything in that sense. Some people are thinking materially, but then they, they'll think God needs us relationally as if there's not a blessedness and a perfected happiness in, in the Godhead uh, apart from his creatures that commune with him. And that's a lie. God is in no need of us relationally either. Yet look at what he does in his own free will. He chooses to create and redeem and bring into fellowship with him those creatures that need him that he doesn't need. So extrinsic glory is that which doesn't essentially belong to God's nature, but is a manifestation of his nature through the works that he does. And then we ask the question, when we hear, when we make those two broad categories and we divide up that simple that uh, summary definition with its various aspects, when we divide it up into two major categories of who God is intrinsically and what God does extrinsically, the next question we asked was, what does that intrinsic glory refer to? And systematically, when we think about all these various texts that, that are addressing God's nature and speaking of glory, his name and speaking of glory, his attributes, one or more. What is the Bible teaching us uh, when we say that God is intrinsically glorious or he has intrinsic glory? What is the Bible as a whole referring to? That's what, what we were trying to answer last week. And we... we Ask that question, and then we say, well, we need to look at the extrinsic works of God and the Word of God in order to teach us about that intrinsic glory that we're seeking to define as how it relates to God and what it refers to in God. And when we reminded ourselves of, of that, we saw that, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but under that wide-ranging view of God's intrinsic glory, we saw that... Um, Glory gets referred to the presence of God. And if he's present in some manifestation in history, whether with Israel or with uh, the new covenant, then if we're saying that God is present in glory or he came in the cloud in glory, it that word glory is a reference to something about who he is. Like when... We say, I am present with you in creation. We're speaking about ourself. You know, we're speaking not about uh, a part of ourself, but our whole self. So to say that this is God's presence and use the word glory with reference to that is very broad sweeping. To have that the word glory gets referred to God's name or a designation of God's name is very broad. If he's the king of glory, um, and we're speaking about a designation of God, we can see that that word glory intrinsically is speaking uh, more broadly about him. And then in the works, we saw that all of these works speak to him. So everything he's doing, doing, whether it be creation, providence, or salvation, are speaking to his intrinsic glory. And then we saw that his intrinsic glory gets referred to when certain attributes are d described, like power. And instead of saying power, it says the glory of God, raised by the glory of God. Instead of uh, grace, you know, it will speak of God's glory revealed in showing grace. So we can see that these attributes of God, we're not looking at one when the Bible speaks of glory it's looking at multiple and having seen that we came up with this answer which I added God's intrinsic glory revealed and is revealed in many ways through his extrinsic glory and is holistically and holistic and wide-ranging uh, 
It's, it's a broad sweeping term. It's not a specific term like immutability, impassibility, or love, or justice. It's broad. It is a reference to God's name and a sum total of his attributes, a reference to what he is holistically. So it's a broad term. Okay, so any questions there before we get into the lesson this morning? Okay. So picking up now, that's kind of the, the end of seeking to define things where we are in these eight lesson uh, track that we're on. And now let's just consider the intrinsic, extrinsic glory uh, with reference to other theological doctrines and with reference to it, God's intrinsic glory expressed in redemptive history. So on the handout, there's, there's uh, eight points under that fourth and if you notice, the first four, I'm sorry, the first three are worded a particular way, God's glory, God's glory, God's glory. And then the next three, God's extrinsic glory, God's extrinsic glory, God's extrinsic glory. I'm sorry, the next four, God's extrinsic glory. And then the last one is a summary statement or just a reminder about our personal salvation. But if you were to circle these things and divide them up, you could take the first three and lump them together and take the second, uh, the next four and lump them together and make the last one on its own. And the reason why I bring that up is there's a little bit of a difference in what we're doing when we get to those second four. The first three, we're considering God's intrinsic and extrinsic glory in these important truths like transcendence and eminence. But then we're considering... In the next four, with God's extrinsic glory, we're more looking at God's extrinsic glory manifested in redemptive history. In those theological topics as they relate to redemptive history, like particularity and universality. Okay, so with the first one, God's glory is transcendent and imminent. And if those words are foreign to you, let's ask the question, what does that mean when we say transcendence with reference to God and eminence with reference to God? Does, can someone answer that to remind us? Pastor Michael? We were just talking about that this week in small group as we were uh, covering his omnipresence. And um, imminence is God's nearness, right? That he's, he's close. He's not a God who is far away, but one who is near at hand. You know, I am with you. Um, transcendence um, speaks of how, like, um, at least in the study of omnipresence, is how um, creation, the the universe cannot contain God. He transcends. You know, the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built, he says, uh, Solomon. Amen. Thank you very much. That's spot on. Um, transcendent, if, if uh, I want to read that one real quick, uh, just a dictionary definition. Transcending or surpassing uh, beyond the limits of our limits. Uh, so, as Pastor Michael said, just to think about transcendence and eminence, it, it does come into play when we think, I, I, I think I have this tendency, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe some others might too, that when I hear eminence and transcendence, that I'm thinking spatially, like in space, like when God's near, His presence in some form is near. And we can say that, that when God spoke to Moses face to face, that there's a manifestation of God's eminence there. And that transcendently, this realm of heaven uh, is distant from us. And sometimes I think we think spatially on that. And Perhaps that's not wrong, 
But go beyond just spatial categories when you think about eminence and transcendence. Um, God is transcendent in the fact that he's different. In other words, he is infinite and we're finite. He's transcendent in that uh, other attributes, that he is simple and not made up of parts or complexity. He is pure spirit, um, whereas we are made up of parts and dependent on our very parts in order to be what we are. Um, and we could go into all those other attributes, but that's speaking about God's transcendence also. It's in his holiness, his uniqueness is different from us. And his eminence can also be seen not spatially that he's manifesting some uh, glorious presence by being near or the incarnation coming to us. That is certainly uh, eminence. But also just in the way that he relates in various terms. It, it might not be in our perception of things, a realization of his nearness spatially, like we can recognize that uh, in our soul, God seems to be distant, distant from our perspective. The psalmist will uh, say those things. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that God is not imminent and near and relating he is still imminent in the fact that he's with the believer despite their ability to recognize his withness of them. Um, the word of God itself is an imminent manifestation of the glory of God where he is relating to us by coming near with language that we might know him. So imminence speaks of those things where God uh, condescends and although invisible incomprehensible and infinite he relates in ways that are comprehensible to his creatures and creation and it doesn't necessarily mean a spatial category does that help so when you take God's intrinsic glory and his extrinsic glory and we think about those two categories with these other theological categories, eminence and transcendence, we can see them, we can see how his transcendence and his eminence are uh, other ways of perceiving his glory or other ways of seeing his glory manifested. And let's start with God's glory fills the tabernacle and temple. So if you go to Exodus 40, Verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the, tab the tabernacle. And I'm going to read the next verse. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So, where is eminence in those two verses? God's nearness, His relating to us, His condescending to relate. Where do we see that in this text? Uh, Sergio. The Lord filling the temple. Okay. Can you, can you say a little bit more? Like, why is that an eminent manifestation? To, for I agree with you. But why would you say that's his eminence filling the temple? Because um, it's something that you could like experience. Yes, you know? exactly. That's that's you're right on top of it. So God is invisible, incomprehensible, 
And yet Moses and those present experienced some work of God that they knew this was a extrinsic manifestation of the glory of God and he is near in this work through this cloud. Right? God, if God had not done that, they would have, they, throughout all their perception of anything, they would not have been. It's, man cannot climb the Tower of Babel to heaven. Um, God must come down to man for man to relate to him and know him. And that's exactly what God does. So his eminence is here in this cloud filling that, the, that room of that tabernacle. Sure. You know, like his, so God being omnipresent, he, he's there in that tabernacle, right? Whether, whether or not they perceive his presence or not. Um, so y- yes, the the cloud, him filling filling the tabernacle with the cloud, is is um, there so that they can recognize his presence. But in a sense, God is also saying something to the people in manifesting himself in the cloud at that particular location, and um, it's it's usually referred to as his gracious presence. He's, he's there appearing um, or manifesting himself in his glory uh, to communicate grace to, to, those, to those people, to Moses and the people of Israel. That he's there not as a consuming fire at that, at that moment, though he is a consuming fire. He's manifesting himself in a, in a way that is pleased to dwell amongst men. So, like, not only is he... Um, making himself known so that they will recognize his presence is there, but that he's there in a disposition of grace and love and favor towards those who experience Amen. that manifestation. You know? Amen. Thank you. Okay, so we can see in this text that God's extrinsic glory is in and of itself teaching us about God's extrinsic glory. And it's teaching us simultaneously about God's eminence. Where is God's, ex- or, um, God's transcendence in this text? Where in this text would you learn about God's transcendence? And I'll I'll continue to ask questions like this, uh, but I know that thinking this through might not be uh, something that you're understanding what I'm asking. And so I'll give you uh, a answer to that question, and then hopefully that that kind of thought pattern will help you think through other questions I'm going to ask. So where we can see God's transcendence here is in the way God does fill the temple. It says it filled the temple. And then Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle. I I keep saying temple. Not Not able to enter the tabernacle. Why could he not enter the tabernacle? Because that glory of God that he did show in that cloud was as far as that tabernacle went uh, completely consuming of it all. Um, It's not as if God manifested himself in a spatial confined cloud in that tabernacle that they could just sit there and look at. God filled the whole tabernacle so that they can't even stay in there. So he's imminently manifesting him uh, and relating to them through this uh, cloud and showing his grace and his blessing upon uh, the fulfillments of his plans here. But he's also through filling the temple and 
basically through filling the temple, thrusting Moses out, simultaneously teaching them about his transcendence. Any thoughts y'all want to add to that? Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, let's look at uh, 1 Kings 8. So from that, that previous text... We're just looking at the tabernacle, and now we're going to look at the temple. And we're just looking at the cloud and the way that God manifests, the way that God extrinsically reveals His glory. And in the way that He's revealing it, we see eminence that He's doing it and relating to them, but we also see in the way that He's doing it, He's telling them something about His transcendent, intrinsic glory. It's like... Um, yes, there's a relation happening here and a communication of truths that you might know the Lord. And that is imminent. He is drawing near. And it's extrinsic manifestation of His glory. However, that very glory, the way that it is, is being demonstrated, is teaching us about God's intrinsic glory and particularly God's transcendence. So let's look at 1 Kings 8, uh, verse 11. And I'll start at 10. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And this is not a tabernacle now, it's a temple. It's a larger structure. So within that holy place that is representative of future truths to come, or even realities at that time, God's filling the whole thing. So yes, He is condescending and eminently through this extrinsic glory, revealing himself and relating and communicating, but he's doing it in such a way that he's filling it to also teach about his transcendence, his otherness. And it leads to their, they, they find out when God does it this way, we're limited. I'm limited. I can't continue ministering in this way because uh, what I would need to minister has been hindered by this cloud. In other words, God communicates through it that he's other. And look at verse 27. This is Solomon's prayer. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. So Solomon understood, you know, he understood that God was showing mercy and grace and imminently coming near and manifesting himself and would in the temple. He's praying that God would uh, bless them. And in the midst of it, he's declaring uh, a fundamental truth that God is not contained by these things. So that filling of the temple helps communicate that God is not able to be contained. <laughs> so when we think of God's transcendence and His eminence, let me ask some questions now. In these two texts, the, the tabernacle and the temple, um, we saw that God's eminence is there in the fact that he is near in the cloud through this manifestation. He's relating to them and communicating himself to them. And we know, uh, maybe I won't ask questions. I, I'm going to uh, try to keep going. I'm sorry. Uh, with this point. And we also know that 
God is doing this with his extrinsic glory that the cloud itself is not essential to God's nature. Solomon understood that. And, and also we see that in the way God is eminently drawing near and manifesting himself, that that manner or the way in which he did it also teaches about his transcendent nature. And the transcendent nature of God is an aspect of his intrinsic glory. So that, that's what this, this, this uh, point four this morning is seeking to do. It's seeking to take those truths of the fact that there is eminence with God and there is tra- uh, transcendence with God and consider how the extrinsic glory is teaching us about both. Is there a question? Uh, Earlier we had talked about how um, the text from... First Kings and Exodus, they experienced God's transcendence through the clouds. It was a physical experience. They could see it with their eyes. How would you help someone think through now, let's say this morning, you may not be seeing a cloud or experiencing a physical um, or dark cloud floating up in the air, but how mm-hmm. would they, um, how can you still explain transcendence? How can you still experience it even though there's no visual yeah, uh, I, I would say expressly the word of God. You know, Peter said that he saw the Lord glorified and he had the more sure word confirmed. Uh, and what we can see is that uh, scripture is the primary means by which we learn of these things and and the means by which we come to know God, of course, God must uh, act upon that believer who is dead in sin to give them life and regeneration by effectively calling them, illuminating their mind and hearts to receive the word of God and the gospel and simultaneously to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Uh, But the primary instrument is not through what he did back then. Back then, he spoke in a manifold in a variety of ways, through prophets, through events, through... um, you, You can just consider and scan in your mind the Old Testament and the way that God manifested his glory and his will uh, through a lot of different things. I mean, causing an axe head to float, translating Elijah to heaven, and Enoch um, coming in the cool of the garden in, in the Garden of Eden, the cool of the day. Um, many. That's why in Hebrews 1, you know, in these past times, God has spoken these many different ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. And we're not present now in our time in life when the son is here in his humiliation. But we have the testimony of those who who were we have the completed scriptures and we ought not to see that as a a negative I think that we're being creatures we often have a preference to sensual senses and I think that the word of God easily gets diminished and our hearts and in our minds when we look for what people had in the past or we look for experiences today. Um, But the Bible's clear that this is uh, more sure. So, um, I hope that answers your question. When, when the Lord Jesus appeared to uh, James um, and he wouldn't believe him. Uh, no, uh, no, not James, but uh, Thomas, doubt, Doubting Thomas. That, oh, yeah. Sorry, Doubting Thomas. Um, he, he didn't believe until he saw the Lord Jesus and put his hands in his, uh, put his fingers in his hand and in his side. And Jesus tells him, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe, though they do not see. Amen. Amen.
And uh, if you will go to Psalm 8 now. Verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Where is God's eminence in this text? There, Amy? I heard you speaking. I know you didn't raise your hand. Um, you set, you have set your glory above the heavens. Okay, yeah, his glory above the heavens. So, eminence, remember, is him near, and I, I would say his glory being set above would be his transcendence. So, uh, his eminence would be seen in in all the earth. So, God, there is a manifestation of God's eminence in relate, relating, communicating of Himself condescending, drawing near through creation. Um, creation teaches us many things about God. And even Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. So that's a manifestation of God's eminence. And we know that that's ex- God's extrinsic glory, the, the creation. And you have set your glory above the heavens. So he is surpassing of the creation and the heavens. That above speaks of his differentness, his otherness, his transcendence. Let's go to the next point. The, God's glory is full and received. See, the, these, these categories, uh, people often have trouble holding to both of them simultaneously. They want to say, if God is transcendent and other, incomprehensible and uh, invisible, spirit, simple, unlike me, uh, you know, all those terms, speaking of his transcendence, then he's unknowable. He's, I'm unable to relate to him. How will I know this God that's incomprehensible? And they see a problem with saying that God is near. And they ask questions about how can he be near and simultaneously far? Or when some people say God is near, look at this. He, he came in the cloud. And he's here in this manifestation. And he spoke, he spoke to Moses. And they want to make God... Uh, where he's not transcendent and deny his transcendence and say, well, he's like a man because he spoke to Moses. He's like a man because he expresses that he's angry. And they want to deny transcendence of God. And, And combining them or seeing them simultaneously as not in contradiction to one another but occurring in the same text should help you see that God is both. And that God's extrinsic glory reveals both. The fact of the glory is eminence. And then what the glory often teaches is transcendence. And the next area that's uh, difficult to categories that people seek to try to grapple with is that God is full, meaning in, in that sense there, what that's saying is that God is I say of himself, from himself. God is independent and absolutely free, under no necessity to do anything by the creature. And everything he does is with total freedom. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. He's free to do that. Um, and he's full in the sense that he doesn't need anything. Self-sufficient. Independent and free. No, no one is that way. You know, like uh, 
in Proverbs, it, it says uh, the lazy man will be put to forced labor. So there's, when you're a lazy person, you're going to wind up in a job where you have less freedoms. And are, there's a less demanding or a, a, a less desirable activities that you're going to be doing. Oftentimes those activities are at least less desirable because they're so restrictive. Not always, but um, you see a man skilled in his work, he'll stand before kings. And to have a high position before people in authority, uh, you're given a lot of freedoms. Um, and that, that's just the principle that, that exists in God's government. Well, it should help. Rem- I'm just using that as an illustration. God is absolutely free. If Nebuchadnezzar in the glory of his kingdom thought he was free to do what he wanted, when he wanted, however he wanted, he is like infinitely limited compared to God. God is absolutely free. There's nothing that can withstay his hand or stay his hand. So when we say God is full, God's glory is full, that's what we're speaking of. And in that sense, it's speaking of God's intrinsic glory. But he receives glory. Isn't that interesting? He's full, in need of nothing, and yet he receives glory from the creature. So we got to understand that, right? Well, let's look at Psalm 50. Verse 7, God's glory in his fullness. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will now rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. He's full. He doesn't need. And then if you go to Revelation 4, God who was and is and is to come is worthy to receive glory. Verse 8, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. He receives glory. It's not that God needs it. Uh, So very clearly God says all things are mine and he is not in need of us. He graciously gives and causes things to be. Um, But when he receives glory, that's God uh, bringing those people into a knowledge of himself through that praise, through that glorifying of him. So he receives it not for his own gain, but for their gain. Because in our worship and obedience to God is our truest fulfillment of who we are. It's the closest we can come to perfect joy in this life. Um, Joy is something that will not be perfected until glorification but it's tied with our worship and our communion and fellowship with God who is, who, who was, who is, and who is to come. Because he doesn't need and he doesn't gain by the reception of the glory, but he causes it and, and uh, commands it because it is for their good and their gain. 
And in that receiving of glory in that way, uh, we can see God's intrinsic glory even better. Man's not like that. We're, we're, not, we're not concerned like that with each other. Um, the God who, the true and living God is the one that, uh, I like this term, he initiates. He's the, the good shepherd that goes. And even when he uh, saves and delivers, he brings them into a fellowship with him through the Spirit and changing their nature. And in their communion, their knowledge and praise of him, they are undergoing great gain. They're undergoing fulfillment for why he created them. The blessedness of that communion is uh, poured out upon them and they are uh, benefited. And all of this activity where it starts with God, he saves and it returns back, is ultimately to manifest his glory. So God is full and he also receives glory. And we can see that God's uh, fullness is in his intrinsic glory. And his receiving comes from his extrinsic glory. Because he, he created, he redeemed, and he brings in near. And all that's his extrinsic glory. And then in the process of him causing that to happen where he receives glory, he's teaching us more of his intrinsic glory. Okay, next one. God is, God's glory is unique and shared. So similar to full and received, how is it that God says in Isaiah 42, 8, if you'll turn to there, Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. My, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. So God is unique, and he will not give his glory to another. That which is appropriate to him, he will not give. Right? You see that right there. My glory I will not give to another. And yet, God shares his glory. Those are not contradictory concepts. It's just you have to understand in what sense does he mean I will not give my glory. And in what sense does he we, we mean when he says that we, he shares. Um, and if you go to... John, actually go to Isaiah 55 since we're in Isaiah. Isaiah 55, 5. He's speaking to a true Israel here. And nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. You see how He glorifies them so there's some participation or sharing from God in His extrinsic glory, causing them to be glorified. So, when we think of God being unique in His glory, uh, that does not preclude or exclude Him sharing in some sense His glory with His creatures. In John 17, 22, Jesus said that. He said, um, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. We know that God is alone God, and that when there is a sharing of God's glory or the glory which you gave me that we receive, 
it's not that we receive transcendence or that we receive immutability or we receive uh, any of the attributes of God, sovereignty, absolute sovereignty, absolute freedom. It's not that God is sharing his transcendence in that way. He is sharing, though, uh, his through his extrinsic glory, uh, communicable attributes that are an imitation of his own and like him, like the moral law. All those attributes of God that we learn from the moral law, he communicates to his creature and causes them to fulfill and be. Um, I could go more, but the point is, is that God's glory is not only unique intrinsically, but extrinsically it's shared. Okay. We're getting close to time, so let me just review these last few, and then I want to read something. We didn't get into it, but God's extrinsic glory, when you think of redemptive history and what the Bible speaks about God and His extrinsic glory, He is very selective and particular in history. He chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Israel. They were a small number. And not any other nation. He... Uh, Jesus, when he came, he went to Tyre and Sidon and there was a woman that came to him and he said, I haven't been sent to you. So even in his ministry, he knew it was relegated to Jerusalem and the Jews. Yet in her faith, she said, even the little dogs can eat crumb, you know, the crumbs from the table. And he said, great is your faith. And he, he answered her request. But God was particular. When Jesus went to his own hometown, they wanted to see him perform an extrinsic glorious work. And he said, no physician, um, you'll say physician, heal yourself. And no prophet is welcome in his own country. And then he gave two examples from the Old Testament that there were a lot of people that were uh, desperate in these different situations. And God only chose over here a non-Jew and over here another non-Jew. God is particular in history, but yeah, he's universal. The heavens declare the glory of God. Um, the gospel is, goes out to all who hear. The judgment is for all mankind who are all culpable and accountable to God. And God's extrinsic glory is already and not yet. So even though we're saved, we're not yet saved in one sense because there is a glorious resurrection to come. So... Also, we could talk about God's sovereignty and responsibility and ultimate end and other ends. So his ultimate end is to bring glory to himself. But what's amazing is that God uses a lot of intermediate and uh, other ends in the midst of bringing that ultimate. And that's what I'll re read about. Understanding this is significant as it helps us address a common question concerning God's glory. If God seeks his own glory above all things, does this mean that he is selfish? After all, if we seek our own glory, we are deemed selfish. The standard answer to that line of questioning is that God is the ultimate being in the highest end and we are not. And that's a good answer. Good behavior seeks the highest end, so God making himself his own ultimate end is appropriate. If we make ourselves the highest end, however, we are act acting inappropriately because we treat ourselves as the highest end when we are not. That argument is surely correct and beneficial in many ways, but fails to do justice to much of the biblical emphasis on, on concerning God's goodness and love. And I want to read this. The argument under, understates God's genuine desire for the good of his creature, and it fails to show how God's love and his glory are united. Passages like the ones we just read, and they were reading similar texts to what we've been reading, underline how God saves us out of love, displays his kindness toward us for all eternity, and is glorified through the entire display. In this way, God is self-giving and self-exalting, saving us for our good and for his glory. <laughs> 
He gives himself to us, which simultaneously meets our needs and and demonstrates his sufficiency. Thus, his love and his glory cohere. Last part, that God is simultaneously self-giving and self-exalting is also displayed in the mutual glorification of the persons of the Trinity. The glorious Father sends the glorious Son, who voluntarily humbles himself and glorifies the Father through his incarnation, obedient life, and substitutionary death. In response, the Father glorifies the Son, resurrecting him from the dead, exalting into the highest place. The Father sends the glorious Spirit who glorifies the Son, and all this takes place to the glory of the Father. Um, so what exists in the Trinity is happening in similitude to the creature. And although we're not, experience, although we're not being communicated transcendence and sharing in that sense of the Trinity, we are coming into a relation and a communion with God to His glory. And the fact that we're benefited because God has condescended and has manifested love toward us and judgment is also a manifestation of his glory. So let's thank God and we'll pray. Father in heaven, we praise your holy, transcendent name. We praise you that you have come near to each of us and it is personal. Uh, We praise you, Lord, that you are self-sufficient and you in your glory have chosen to manifest it by causing us to share in in an appropriate way to what we are as your image bearers. We praise you for Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, and his work on our behalf, and pray that by the Spirit we would trust you and that we would seek in our lives to make you and your glory the ultimate end of all that we do. I pray that our worship this morning would do that very thing. In Christ's name, amen.